Okay. Well, welcome everyone to the August uh, Adobe Marketo Engage Champion Office Hours. I am your moderator for today, Sarah Ryan. Uh, we're going to go over a couple of housekeeping slides to give you a little bit more uh, context, and then we'll introduce our champions for today and uh, answer some of your questions. So let's get going. So first of all, some of the house rules. Um, this is one of our, uh, the champion office hours are one of our user groups. So we follow the same house rules as all of the Marketo Engage user groups. Uh, no self-promotion. Don't contact people outside of the user group without their consent. Um, and if anyone shares their use cases, whether it is one of the champions or one of the uh, other attendees, uh, please do not share that without uh, that information without their consent. So uh, this is a safe place where we can all share and learn and uh, hopefully there are no issues following these. Um, as a note, this uh, this meeting is being recorded. It will be posted to our uh, YouTube channel uh, after the fact. So you can uh, catch the recording there. If you do not want to be on a recorded meeting, feel free to uh, catch that later. Okay. If you're not already, um, please join the Bevy group. Make sure that you get the notifications every time a new uh, office hours is scheduled. Uh, you can go to mugs.marketo.com. That is the URL for the specific champion office hours. You can also look at some of the other user groups that you may be interested while you're there. A couple of other opportunities uh, coming up. This just opened recently, the 2025 Experience Maker Awards. Definitely a really amazing opportunity to get uh, recognized for the great work that you're doing. Um, this features, um, you know, customers who have gone through great transformations and really um, have uh, great stories to tell about uh, about their use of Adobe products. So check that out. Uh, there are different categories that you can uh, nine different categories that you can submit in um, and it is uh, a great, great experience if you are a finalist or a winner. There's a great gala at Summit, and um, definitely a really, a really good way to recognize the, uh, the hard work that you've been doing. So, um, okay. Office hours for interactive webinars. So the product team is uh, making themselves available to really answer your questions around the new interactive webinars feature for, um, for Marketo and. Uh, there is definitely documentation that you can uh, that you can review on your own as well. But if you still have questions, you can sign up for those office hours, um, and it's a really great opportunity to really dig in there and uh, get started with the really cool feature. A new learning path uh, for implementing a new Marketo Engage instance. You may have also seen the inheriting um, an instance uh, learning path. This one is specifically for a new one. Lots of things go into setting up a brand new Marketo instance. So this is a really helpful step-by-step uh, -step, uh, guide with uh, tutorials to really help you make sure that your implementation is successful and um, getting all those all those details, uh, including like syncing fields with the CRM. So um, check that out. A couple of uh, of other user groups. These uh, some of these have already happened. Some of them are upcoming. So take a look at that. But really, just give you an idea of what we see um, coming through the Mark Marketo user groups on a monthly basis. Definitely see a lot um, a lot of them across the world. Check that out. And if you like today, you will also like September. So uh, we have some more amazing champions. Um, for the September office hours, go ahead and sign up for that now. That is, that registration is also live. So, um, okay. Without further ado, we have our uh, champions for the, today. Um, I am going to pass it to them to introduce themselves and um, a little bit extra about yourself. So I like a good icebreaker. So. In addition to introducing yourself, if you could each say, um, if you were to compete in a uh, an elite sporting competition uh, of any brand, uh, and you, what would the what would be your sport of choice? Where you think you would have the best chance of meddling, whether it's a real sport or maybe a made up mops related sport. 
Um, I'm going to go from right to left. So Carissa, uh, Carissa you go first, please. All right. So my name is Carissa Russell. Um, I'm currently a senior marketing operations analyst at McGraw-Hill Education. Um, I've been in Marketo since about 2013, and this is my third year as a champ. Um, and what sport would I have a hope of meddling in? None, because I'm extremely unathletic, but I really enjoy watching skateboarding, probably because I put a lot of time into Skater Die and Tony Hawk. <laughs> nice. Zoe, uh, tell us about yourself. Hi, uh, Zoe Foreman. I'm based in the UK. I'm a senior marketing operations specialist covering the EMEA and APAC region for MSA Safety, which is a uh, manufacturer. Um, this is my first year as a champion. Um, and as a sport, I would probably go for triathlon and I would be uh, racing under the Jamaican flag. Nice. Great uh, facts about you. Go ahead, Jenny. Why? Uh, I just have to ask, why the Jamaican flag? Uh, because I was born in Jamaica, uh, married in Jamaica, and have a Jamaican passport. That's I'm a dual, na dual yeah. nationality, British and Jamaican. So whichever one to take me, but I think I've got more chance with the Jamaican team. Love it. That's great. My uh, my nephew is thinking about trying to do soccer for Luxembourg because we have dual citizenship there. Same kind of similar situation. Well, I'm Jenny Robertson. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Annuitus. Um, it's a boutique agency in Atlanta. And um, there I had the consultant team, the um, digital team, and the data science team. I've been in Marketo for a little over 13 years. I've been part of the CHAMP program for 10. I'm super excited to be here today. And um, if I wanted to try to win a gold, I have to say, I'm I mean, I consider myself kind of athletic, but I don't think I could really win a gold in many sports. So I think I'd have to go skeet shooting because I think I could be good enough at that, maybe. Nice. And I don't think we have Chris with us yet. So, yeah. oh, awesome. Uh, Chris, please introduce yourself. Uh, thank you. My name is Chris Kelly. Uh, I am a principal marketing automation architect uh, at Qualified Digital. And I have been working with Marketo for uh, five plus years, and this is uh, amazingly my first year as a, a champion. Very excited. Uh, if I had to choose a sport, it would probably be soccer or swimming. Love both. Soccer if I had to choose. <laughs> nice. Okay. Well, I'm going to stop sharing and open the floor to you all for the first question. So, um, and while I do that, let me get the questions. So, um, we are going to kick it off with um, some questions about learning, right? So, we were talking about, uh, you know, being how we, what we would meddle in if we were, if we were athletes. Um, we're going to talk about staying at the top of our game uh, as, as MOPS uh, practitioners. So I'm going to uh, start with Carissa. Can you share kind of what, what you do to stay, uh, stay up with the latest on Marketo? Do you have a certain uh, like process you follow? What's your routine? Or are there like certain resources that you use primarily? Sure. I mean, I think that's a really great question because I think, you know, we get into technology to continually learn. I mean, the field is constantly advancing. So you get into it because you love to learn. Um, and I kind of like to approach it three different ways. Um, you know, first and foremost, like I like to cultivate that knowledge atmosphere in my internal role. So a team of learning, for example, some things we do right now is every single month we have a team meeting and we share learning. So some of our specialists are getting into velocity scripting. So it's really fun to be able to share that within the team. And then being a part of McGraw Hill, we're a multiple business unit business. Um, so we also lead um, our BU wide meetings. So then we get to share with the other businesses and share with the other regions, um, you know, working a lot with higher ed, they do a very different um, audience market, but, you know, we've shared templates and we've shared different processes for sampling that has really helped internally. So, you know, that's one way to approach it internally. Um, you know, externally, I think Adobe has amazing learning opportunities. Um, I've been a huge fan of my local mug chapter in Cleveland. 
Um, you know, it's a great way to learn from your peers. They have a lot of amazing education um, It every single one. And just even learning from other people in your local area. They're all experts in their own way. And it's so interesting to see how they do business and learn from them. There's virtual ones as well. So if you don't have a local chapter, there's really great virtual mugs you can join anytime during the year. Um, but, you know, if you're not into those by seeking out those opportunities, I also like to really um, put that knowledge on the things that I do every day. So ways to do this is, you know, if you're on LinkedIn a lot, um, you know, follow thought leaders. So, you know, there's so many good examples on this call. You know, Jenny, Chris, you both post so much of learnings on there. There's lots of champs who do this. Um, so follow them. Put that learning in front of you so you can just absorb it in your daily life. Um, so those are some different ways I like to, you know, keep it fresh and top of mind and expose myself to it in multiple channels. Because like I said, we always have to keep learning. Amazing. Yeah, I know that when the uh, annual champion announcement goes out, like everybody's follows uh, kind of start exploding, right? <laughs> the so notification explosion, yeah. Yeah, like it, it's basically a guide to who to follow to, you know, keep learning. So um, great recommendation there. Anyone have any anything else? I know, Zoe, I think you had some thoughts too. Yeah, I mean, the other thing, uh, backing up what Clarissa said, is things like the uh, the product releases. Um, there's a lot of information there about the pre uh, So it's about keeping up to date with uh, with obviously Marketo, but also with the integrations and uh, and other uh, platforms within um, uh, marketing operations. Uh, and then the other thing is that it's it's also it's it's a balance between uh, self development and learning and your own curiosity, but passing that forward. Um, I love mentoring and uh, and helping others, and also sharing what I learn. So internally, uh, with, with we're split up by regions, but one thing I, I do is um, I have a monthly flash updates. So that's maybe uh, a new platform that I've integrated within uh, one of my regions, um, and it's to share it with the global. So it's to show it, it's a flash update. Um, this is something new we're doing. It's maybe a new segmentation, and then other things like. And then I've taken the deep dive uh, concept, and uh, I do these maybe every um, every two months, and then I'm and then I follow them back up. So I'm just about to do uh, a couple on nurtures and newsletter. And it's about process enhancements, improvements, how we've uh, uh, managed uh, Marketo. And I do those, and that's about continuous improvement, reporting out, saying what the successes are, and uh, and passing that information on. So uh, don't keep your information and your knowledge to yourself. Be, be, be free and share it. And, and then that's the, well, that's the best way I learn. And if you get that enthusiasm and can pass that on, then it, it becomes infectious. Definitely. That's always my favorite part of Marketo is like finding someone else and like seeing the light in their eyes when they get it, right? Mm -hmm. Like passing on that knowledge. It's amazing. Um, Chris, we got a question specifically around like learning more about Velocity Script. Uh, do you want to share any insights there? Sure. Um, so love Velocity Script. I think it's an incredibly powerful tool if you can uh, use it effectively and it really just opens so many different options for you. So it really depends on what you're trying to do and your comfortability with learning um, a coding style. So first and foremost, it is code. So if you don't have any experience with it, it can seem a little bit daunting and for sure it is. And uh, coding within Marketo is not helpful. Uh, but what I suggest is always choose something small, right? I am going to make the word hello world show up on my email and uh, it will really allow you to find pieces of, oh, I didn't know I had to do that, right? So you're going to continuously build on your knowledge as you hit your roadblocks. But if you do something small, you get to see that I'm achieving something immediately and it shows you that even though it's not as intuitive as it could be, I'm still doing it, I'm still learning, I'm still getting feedback and, and I'm still winning. Um, but my response is keep at it. Always keep at it. Um, it's most likely gonna be something small. So don't think that you're a complete failure when you're not getting any errors back, but your email isn't showing up at all. So um, like I said, there's so many opportunities for um, reaching out to uh, other people who are 
working in the industry about it or going on to Nation and asking your questions, um, going into chat groups. Um, everybody is so willing to help. Um, there's a lot of different um, blog posts that you can look up. Just type in exactly what you're trying to do. And most of the time, you're going to find something similar. It might not always be the exact same thing, but you're always going to find something similar. So that's what I always always suggest works. I always suggest start small and then start building up to what you're trying to accomplish. But all those learnings are really going to be amazing when you stay in your back pocket. So you can say, oh, hey, I can do this really cool extra thing that I wasn't even thinking about before or um, just building on that whole idea of sharing your knowledge and then people will return that back to you in kind. So um, start small. Um, if you have access to another code editor, I would try and do that first. Uh, so it will catch your syntax errors maybe, but uh, Marketo's specifically, isn't that great? So um, just know that there's going to be a little bit of a learning curve there. Anybody else have any tips and tricks uh, getting your feet wet with Velocity? You touched on it pretty good. The community is great. I agree. Everyone's willing to help. And that, yeah, don't don't be scared by it. Sure. Yeah, my first foray into Velocity, I found like the exact code pretty much that we we needed on on the community, right? Um, but then obviously, you know, you tweak it so that so that it works for your instance and right, like just starting from from something and adapting it is such a good way to learn like how how to how everything actually works, right? Um, if yeah, you you know, if you don't perhaps have the time to like learn velocity from the ground up, right? Um, maybe maybe better to <laughs> to learn holistically, but I think you can also uh, take mm -hmm. that like tweak and learn approach as well. So. You'd be awesome. surprised too, as marketers, you might not have a developer on your team, but you might have developers at your company who wouldn't mind giving you a helping hand too. Yeah. I've found that like when you can show, like if you, if you have a developer friend at your company and you show like, Hey, this is a cool, the cool thing that I saw. Like if you present someone with a cool, like a cool result that has a technical challenge behind it like you know people love to solve uh solve problems and so you could definitely get some people uh, helping you out as like a pet project as well yeah. absolutely that's good uh if you sorry sorry uh just random thought it's very similar to uh javascript so if you have um some people who are pretty familiar with that and uh, are able to work with them they're really able to take a lot of that knowledge and essentially modify it using the, the developer guide. Um, thank you, Christine, for uh, posting that. But there's a lot of information out there that you can absolutely work from. Uh, you're not alone, and you'll always have uh, some starting points. So. Awesome. Great, thank you. Um, OK, we're going to move into some best practices. So we'll start with some uh, best practices around keeping your database clean, reducing manual errors. <laughs> All of that good stuff that we uh, try to try to do. So, uh, Zoe, let's kick it off with you. Um, what is your favorite thing to automate in Marketo to kind of reduce the manual error from the equation? Um, data capture for me. So um, things like data capture and list uploads. So if you can, if you can, and where you can use templates, it, it's important that you get those standard values from a pick list, um, and, and also if you. If you if you're um, synced to a CRM, you need to make sure whilst Marketo can be forgiving, something like Salesforce, it's it's black or white, it's binary, it has to be correct. So to reduce those sync errors, uh, you need to be um, getting the uh, the correct information up front. Um, the biggest problem is with um, form fills where you've got text, open text boxes, um, human error comes in, people get lazy, they spell, misspell their own names. Um, so another thing to automate is data standardization. 
um, adding capital and uh, letters where you've just got a string of lowercase. And that'll pay dividends going forward if you want to, um, if you're going to personalise, um, rather than sending somebody's name, Zoe, Sarah, all in lowercase or a, a mishmash of characters or misspelling. So where I where I can use um, the automation, whether that be through smart lists, whether it be self-service flow steps, um, but uh, really a lot of the time is going back to templates or um, global forms um, to make sure you get that consistent data, um, not just especially if you're working for a global company um, uh, going across. So. Yeah, it's um, and of course now there's uh, there's open AI and chat GPT that we can sync to Marketo uh, through flow steps. Um, but yeah, you, use of a, and sometimes you can you can do it absolutely just in, in Marketo with uh, smart campaigns, um, say uh, correcting a a country. Um, we had one case recently where Viet, Vietnam was spelt Vietnam or Vietnam as two words. And that was causing all sorts of errors. So uh, again, just running a, a batch smart campaign once a week um, can can also help clean up in the background. Right, because you don't always have control on on the values that are coming in to Marketo, right? If you're like using LinkedIn uh, integration, for example, right? Like they have have their standard countries. Uh, country values and those may not match what you have in your app. Yeah. So, and, and uh, also events is uh, events or webinars where the, the person's filled in their own uh, badges or their own um, registration. That's certainly where third party list uploads from events or webinars. That's where I, I do find the, the majority of human errors, we call it. Hmm. Well, and then there's the intentional human errors. Versus, yeah. you know, like think about somebody's uh, somebody's job title, for example. If you have what you have from your like data enrichment provider, for example, may not and may not match what they put in the form, right? Like, my title is so long, I never write that in in a form. So okay. I'm sure I'm sure other people are in the same situation. So um, awesome. Anyone else want to uh, jump in? Any other like recommendations, best practices around keeping your database clean? Um, reducing manual errors, anything like that? I'm making sure, I think Zoe touched on it, but templates is so important. Program templates, cloning stuff, standardized things, really key. 100%. Nice. Okay, um, what about um, some best practices around uh, streamlining and like scaling up your campaigns? Um, I think we, we got a question around um, Marketo forms and landing pages. So I think we, you know, we talked a little bit about having having those standardized global forms. Is there uh, anything else you want to add, Carissa, in terms of uh, best practices for forms and landing pages? Yeah, I mean, I think if we're looking at landing pages and emails, um, probably the best bang, bang for your buck is going to be templates. Um, you know, not only can you put them in design studio, so you can use Marketo permissions to control like who can edit them, who can work on them. So it's really great for version control. Um, but also when you create it at the template level and then you're building your landing pages, it connects to that. You're building your emails, it connects to that. Um, so if you have to do any like privacy poly, prop, privacy policy updates or you have to do some branding updates. I mean, I went one year where I had to run through three of those in one year just for tweaks on the logo. Um, <laughs> so having a template system is really great for that because you edit it in one place and then you can actually also approve it from there. Um, so you can kind of wipe that out in one fell swoop. Um, when you get into APIs, you can get even more efficient with that. Um, so I highly, highly recommend templates um, for landing pages and emails um, and not breaking them from those template connections. Um, and as far as forms, you know, I know you mentioned uh, global forms, Jenny, um, and you know, we definitely use a master form system where we're at and I highly recommend that. But if you've never heard that before, what the heck even is a master form system? <laughs> So I like to approach it with two questions. Um, so I, the first question is, what types of requests do you get as a business? Um, and then secondarily, uh, how do you handle those types of requests for your business? Um, so to give you a use case example, um, at McGraw-Hill, uh, we have a certain variety of request types. So we'll have people who are requesting to contact their sales rep. We'll have people requesting online samples. Um, you know, we'll have people requesting demos. Um, so these are different types of requests that are fielded by different teams. Um, we have an added complexity 
where uh, the different a different team will service that request type based on what product it's attached to. So while Marketo is super powerful and we can write in all these fancy um, routing rules to make sure that it goes to the right place, um, as far as breaking down those master forms, um, it worked out very well. Now we have a system where we have one form per request type per product portfolio. Um, so it breaks down into, I mean, it's a number of forms, but 25 is better than 100. And how that translate to the translates to the user is, let's say you're on mheducation.com and anywhere you see a K to 12 schools contact your rep form, that is gonna be the same physical form on any, any iteration of our website. So whether that's our domain, whether that's a Marketo landing page, it's always going to be that singular form. Um, and one quick tip I always like to add uh, for forms is make sure that you put your form number in the form asset name in Marketo. Um, a lot of the time you're troubleshooting these things and you're looking at the code on the website and you go by form number. So when you have that in your instance as well, you can grab that number out of the code and put it in your instance and find that form right away. So using master forms and then putting that number in the form name are super helpful for those for streamlining that. Yeah, that is my favorite form tip ever. Game changer. Definitely. I learned that way too late, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I I just, yeah, share that one every time <laughs> anyone asks, Always. for sure. Can yeah. I just add one one thing on forms? So uh, we do obviously have global forms, but uh, being under GDPR, we also need to make sure that all our forms um, are GDPR or privacy po policy compliant. So we have some uh, Java uh, API script running in the background. So as soon as the person puts the country in, that will display the legal text and one or no checkboxes, depending whether it's GDPR, which is explicit, or another country like Canada, which um, is implied. So having that to make sure that at the point of capture, you are compliant with uh, your local or national or international um, privacy laws. So uh, if in doubt, make friends with your legal team. Um, always get them to sign off. Um, and um, and But then that way, we're running global forms. So if, if somebody in America filled in a form from Europe, then uh, we're still capturing that consent because through segmentation, we know that that person's actually from the UK or Germany or France. Um, and then the other thing is also using dynamic forms to change the language. Uh, because again, with the privacy policy, you have to present it in that person's language. So if they fill in a form on an American website, but they say if their company's German, they get that privacy policy in German, which is a legal requirement. Great tips, yeah. Um, so many, so many features that you can use, right? Rather than having all these different forms and you know, like having that logic, having the additional script on there, it just really opens up so many possibilities. Thank you. Anyone else want to share any other tips there, or should we move on to automating landing nope. pages and emails? Go, go ahead. The one thing that saved me a lot of hair uh, and time has been not necessarily specific to, to forms, but the use of uh, more global level tokens uh, for the for the ownership program. Uh, if you put all of those tokens spread throughout your entire program, instead of having to sort through everything, you're able to just go to one spot in your in your parent program and then update everything uh, from your cloned or from your template that you just brought in. It just it saves so much time. There's so many less clicks, and uh, if you instantly need to update something, you can just do it in one spot, and it's it's just a game changer for me. Thank you. Um, okay, we got some questions around automating landing pages and emails using API, um, and also automating newsletter creation. Uh, Jenny, do you want to talk us through some of these? Yeah, I can talk through um, more on the email side, but I think the landing page side would work similarly. But we currently automate all of our emails via API. And the way you can go about doing this, um, there's a few different ways. I'll talk you through how we do it with our programs today and how we used to do it. But you can create a base program template Marketo that's going to have your email and it's going to have your send campaign 
And that email is 100% tokenized. So like for our fulfillment emails, we have tokens for, you know, thank you for downloading. We have tokens for title. We have tokens for URL. We have tokens for email. Like everything's a token. Some are folder level, some are program level. And what we do is in our CMS, we have a tagging taxonomy where when you enter content in CMS, you're also putting in these tags. So when you're entering content in CMS, you're putting in the title, you're putting in the little like description and things. And what we do is we have our CMS integrated so that once the content's entered in CMS, automatically via API, it's going to Marketo, it's cloning that base program, it's creating a new fulfillment program. And it's also set that trigger so that it can automatically send fulfillment emails for that content as soon as it's live with no touch of a human. So you can really do some strong, powerful things over API. And I know for me as a marketing ops person, when we first developed this, it was a game changer. So I'm like, you mean I don't have to put a program together every time and test it every time we create a new piece of content in our CMS? So you can automate emails that way. We do the same thing with our nurture. Same thing when somebody creates a new piece of content, it's also creating a nurture email that's automatically added to our program. So there's a lot of things you can do via API and it's really simple to create a base email or program that you can clone and via API update the program level tokens and you're good to go. Um, similarly for newsletter, the process works um, similar. We have our CMS content that is, um, we have our, our base email and our CMS, you know, cloned it out. We've got 12 different newsletter emails, depending on your conversation track and buying stage. And we have our CMS integrated so that every week it will edit those emails with the, all the tokens in the emails with the latest two blog articles and the most relevant content for that week based on some scoring algorithms we have in place. Like when was it created? When was it modified? How much engagement has that content gotten? So the content changes week to week. And then we have the operations for the newsletter in Marketo. So Marketo is controlling, hey, when does somebody get that newsletter? It's a little unique in that the newsletter kind of goes out every day, depending on when you enter the program. It's not like a, hey, send every four weeks on Tuesday kind of thing. And um, that's one way you can automate the e-newsletter and email content. Um, the, the downer to that approach, is the upper is it's, it's automated, yay. The downer is you do lose a little bit of visibility into email deliverability reporting because we're sending the same email every 30 days, but the content in the email is different, right? And for us, the email deliverability wasn't, it's not a big metric for our company, but if you're a company where it is, you could very easily make it clone all that and create a new email every month. For us, we just didn't want 12 emails every month, you know, getting created. But however you need to do it, it's actually really, I want to say it's easy, right? For a marketer who's not a developer, it sounds really hard, but for a developer, it's actually, the API is so strong, it's really easy to automate a lot of that over API. Um, you can also, there's lots of other ways, but Excel sheets, you can populate, put content into an Excel sheet in a way where over API that can then go create 100 emails in like an hour. So lots of different ways you can um, do it over API. I could talk about it for an hour, but <laughs> if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, some some quick gotchas on that. No, I completely agree with you, Jenny. I. I always loved building that type of system. Uh, some quick gotchas though is when you're trying to template out everything, you are limited to I think 40 um, tokens per email. So if you need additional touch points, you are limited in that regard. So just be careful. And you do need to have the base program or that base piece of content in order to grab something via API. It has to exist first and then you can start manipulating it how you need to uh, going forward. Yeah. Awesome. Um, while we are on the subject of APIs, let's um, just kind of open it up. Is there any, do you have any recent examples of, um, of something that you've implemented accessing the Marketo API um, that you wanna share? Any, any cool new feature optimization that you've, uh, that you've uh, leveraged the API to accomplish? Me specifically? You, Chris, Jenny, any open, <laughs> open season. <laughs> uh, something that I've uh, loved playing around with recently is um, totally spacing on the name right now. You can do math now in, in Marketo, right. uh, in, the, in, the smart, in, in smart campaigns. Um, 
that has just changed so much logic problems uh, in general that being able to generate that type of logic uh, and manipulate it via API just it really changes things, right? So instead of having to do five or six steps in order to try and calculate if somebody has um, plus or minus based off of action, you don't have to use a score value anymore. You can actually use um, the uh, number of emails this person opened, right? <laughs> you used to have to have that as a score value, you know, just to increment something is just, right? So um, that is that has been something that I've loved to do and the other piece that I'm really enjoying, uh, which is uh, using utilizing an API, but not necessarily in the same context, is uh, the self-service flow steps um, that mm -hmm. a lot of other champs have been speaking about as well. It's just incredibly powerful. Uh, yeah, just opens up the door to AI or what other endpoints you can dream of. Make it yourself. Awesome. I, I could probably chime in real quick for that question. The specific problem used Marketo. Oh, sorry, not Marketo math, but I was going to say it tied in with the API. It's not new and fancy. It's new to us, but we um, just implemented via API um, a trial nurture for people who are requesting digital trial uh, digital trials of our products. Um, so we got to automate that into Marketo, store those users in a custom object from our external user platform where people were signing up for their digital trials. Um, and now we fully automate that in Marketo. So every week it dumps that data into Marketo and fires off that nurture. So, you know, it is really powerful and it's really fun. And you can do more than just directly on those, you know, records. You can actually build it out in a custom objects and uh, templates and such. Awesome. I think from uh, my end, something new we've done in the last year, we've been automating the emails for a little while, but in the last year we started exporting the activity log so that we can take all those granular activities and incorporate them into our data warehouse and into reporting. And for us, that's really been a game changer. I wish we had started doing it ages ago, but it's been amazing. The lift on the API, but it is awesome. We do that here too. <clears throat> And just very quickly, I've been using it for um, with the third port party uh, badge scanning, uh, lead generation app, Universal. Um, get, going back to what I was talking about earlier, standardizing data. So the guy, the sales reps can have it uh, on their phone. They can badge scan or business card scan. And uh, the questions that are pre-populated for that event, um, I know I'm going to get them in exact format that I need. Um, and it's synced automatically to uh, Marketo. And through a Marketo event program, I then sync them, uh, the MQLs over to Salesforce directly to the, the sales assigned sales rep. So where I would spend probably an hour to two hours, depending on um, what it was, uh, cleaning a list, I'm getting clean lists coming straight in through the API. That is a game changer. It's an hour sa hours saver, we should say. <laughs> awesome. Well, it's... speaking of clean data, or did you have anything more you want to say on that, Chris? No, I, you beat me to it. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, I wanted to dig in a little bit on uh, some recommendations for like cleaning up your database, uh, managing your CRM sync. Also, you know, I think one of the the big issues that causes a lot of headaches uh, with, regarding unclean data is duplicates as well. So, um, any any of that that you want to address, uh, awesome. if you want to focus off, Chris. Well, it just so happens that you can use the API to create your own sync, right? So if you don't want to do the native integration or if you're using a CRM that doesn't have a native integration, you know, NetSuite or what have you, you can utilize the API in order to do that connection automatically. And it's, it's wonderful. Um, but processes that need to happen is uh, absolutely making sure that duplicate information is not brought in either in Marketo or in any type of CRM or other data location that you're passing into Marketo, uh, specifically your native syncs, because Marketo considers the native sync the boss, like source of truth. If Salesforce says that there are two Chris Kellys, then okay, there's two Chris mm -hmm. Kellys. 
<laughs> so uh, 100%, it's a communication that you need to have with whoever is putting data in. If it's just you, you know, have a conversation with yourself and make sure you're not doing it. Um, if you're if you're working with a sales team, you you really need to have that conversation so that they understand why they need to follow this process. They either need to have some sort of automation set up inside of Salesforce, NetSuite, whatever, that will check for duplicates and say you can't put in another Chris Kelly, or they need to do that manual process, make sure that Chris Kelly isn't already in there, and just nip the issue in the butt. The, the moment the data comes in, that's the weakest part. Um, that is the most important part. So keeping your database clean really comes down to understanding the processes, making sure that everybody who is bringing data in understands these processes and are following it. Um, the other pieces that I would suggest is always checking your work, right? So set up weekly, monthly, however often you feel comfortable, make those reports, always do a check. There's a um, built-in possible duplicates smart list inside of your database tab. Go in there, check it, make sure that you're going through and taking care of it sooner rather than later. You will thank yourself. <laughs> you don't you don't want to be looking at over 5,000 duplicates and saying, oh my gosh, what do I do? Um, but we can talk about that. But in general, it's it's like I said, you you do need to be disciplined about how you're bringing in data and everybody needs to know about this process. Um, so I'll open the floor to everybody if they have specific information about certain tools that they like to use or specific examples of uh, gotchas, things like that. I would just say briefly on, on the back of that, Chris, the deduplication, it's something um, we do every every month. Uh, it's a job or a task that nobody wants to do. It's a bit like cleaning your fish tank. It's a task you don't want to do, but the clarity you get afterwards is amazing. And also remember duplicates, whether they be in Marketo or your CRM, they cost you or the company money. They're sitting there. Um, and it may be those duplicates are what take you up into the next price bracket um, on, on either system. And the fact if you've got them in both systems, you're paying for those twice and twice again. So there's a monetary value behind data cleaning or DGP. And also compliance risks as well, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe 100%. one one of those leads is unsubscribed and the other one isn't, right? That's... They, they don't care that you have duplicates. They just know that they unsubscribed. So yeah, any uh, any other tips uh, on managing uh, your data hygiene? I know like we use Bring Lead for deduplication, and like if you if you can afford to have a tool to to solve it, like the level of granularity that that Ring Lead has in putting together like the surviving field rules for um, for everything is just, you know, a marketer's dream uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, you can also do it in um, Marketo with uh, segmentation. Uh, we have a segmentation called chronic non-responders, which is actually uh, inactive people who uh, people who've not engaged in any of our digital activities or channels for 18 months. Um, and again, why keep sending them emails um, uh, and invites if uh, it's going to affect your trust, your open rate, uh, and in effect, over a period of time, they will become worthless or, or junk. So um, be brave and uh, delete those people. Contain them. Uh, and again, again, I'd probably advise, um, uh, I've set up 18 months, but um, I'm looking at the new Gmail and the Yahoo, where they're going to pull out inactive um, accounts at two years. So rather than they pull them out, pull them out just before, hopefully I'll be about two months ahead of um, Gmail and Yahoo. Yeah, that's a good yeah. point. And they become spam trap risks as well, right? If they, mm -hmm. if they just stay in there. So they're yeah. not doing anyone any good in your yeah. system. I know sometimes people face the challenge of, you know, if we delete from Marketo, but our Salesforce team, for example, doesn't want to delete anything or you can't get alignment between teams. I think that's, you know, if you can present that case on like why they are risky and costly mm -hmm. and all of those things that can really help you get that, that alignment you need to tackle the yep. issue. To build on that, 
absolutely. Uh, it's talk, It's going back to the communication about the processes. If they must have it inside of Salesforce, then there needs to be a decision of who is responsible for going in and making sure that these people are selected as do not sync, right? Or uh, who is responsible for the actual deletion? Are, are we going to delete? Are we going to put a flag on people? You know, so that really needs to come down to that communication between the people sharing the system or where are you reporting to, that type of thing. Are we deleting? Are we putting a status? Are we going to disconnect them from a, a natural sync? All of that needs to be discussed. So it's communicate. The biggest thing I can say is communication because if everybody understands the way things are going, that's how And you documentation. Communicate, communicate and get that documented so everybody knows who's who's doing what, when, and how. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And for tools too, right there with Ringlead is um is demand tools is pretty good as well. But Vish, to answer your question in Salesforce, you can set up rules in Salesforce to prevent dupes, but it's up to your admin on how those work. So if your Salesforce is allowing dupes across the lead and contact, you might want to talk to your Salesforce admin about maybe tweaking that. Marketo will not create a duplicate. If it can see the full database and it's a contact, Marketo will not create a lead. It will update that contact. But different Salesforce rules can be in place. Um, they can also cause havoc in Marketo. I've seen Salesforce rules like not want somebody with similar first name, last name, phone number, but maybe it's a different email. Well, to Marketo, a different email is a unique person. So then that that sync gets blocked. So there's definitely things to be working with your Salesforce admin um, in that situation. But I'd probably talk with your Salesforce admin first to see how they've got the duplicate rules set up and then maybe connect with sales on training them on how it works and how Marketo, I've had to talk with sales many times about here's how Marketo integrates with Salesforce and here's how it connects to records and da da da. So really it's more training gap, I think, than anything. Um, as far as uh, as far as deduping, there's a lot of gotchas and I won't mm -hmm. go into too much. I'm currently trying to write a blog post about it, but I'll put a link to um, a session I did at Adobe Summit. But you have to be really careful when you do have a lot of companies have Ringley demand tools just running on a quarterly, monthly, whatever basis. You have to be really careful about like the hierarchy of your merges, making sure you're keeping like a QL over prospect. You have to um, be very careful about when you merge, the lead score can get added together natively. And so then that could cause somebody to QL. You don't want somebody to QL off of a merge. So you have to make sure your smart campaigns account for that. There's actually a ton of scoring gotchas. Um, I won't go into too many details because I know there's other questions to be answered. But yeah, I'll put a link to my session. Um, I'll get it shortly. And then there's a lot of gotchas in there that happen when merges. So um, eventually there will be a blog. Watch for that. It's coming. Yeah. I have also done a, a, an Adobe training specifically on this subject as well. So there's, again, the same with pretty much everything else. All the champions are willing to help reach out if you have specific questions or uh, check the blogs, check the, um, yeah, just ask around and we'll be happy to help. And not to belabor it, but we we are a company that has a lot of intentional dupes that we manage. Um, and we can't get around that. So, you know, a lot of those things, like we have customer service working in our CRM tool in Salesforce. And because of that, there's permission sets within Salesforce that can only see certain records. So we solve a lot of that with sync rules with the sync user. So we make sure that Marketo can't see them. So those duplicates, at least we're not having those duplicates come in. And then we also have an additional fail safe where we've created a, a field that acts as a flag. So we can manually choose to not sync records on that side. And that really helps us manage some things that we can't manage as a business. Awesome. See so much, so much wisdom and passion around duplicates. Like it's always a, always a hot topic. I love it. Such a pain. Yeah. <laughs> pain and passion. Oh. oh yes. Yeah. No, we've and I mean, like even using the word intentional duplicates can get you some major side eye <laughs> as well. So I, I applaud your bravery, <laughs> Chris. <laughs> Does any company not have intentional duplicates? I feel like every company has them for one yes. reason or another. It's just how many fall in that category. How painful yes. is it? It's sizable here, embarrassingly <laughs> so. Yes. 
for sure. Always um, worth the communication. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, they're, <laughs> are they intentional or just not addressed? That's, right. <laughs> that's the difference, <laughs> right? Um, okay, well, you know, moving on to another another hot hot button issue, uh, privacy. So I'm going to pass this one over to Zoe. We got a question specifically around uh, China's privacy laws. Um, how, like, how have have you handled handled this? Uh, some people are just they're not marketing to anyone in China anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, have you moved them out of Marketo? Any you know any recommendations that you have there? Yes, well, I, I work for an American company, um, so we have a policy that uh, if um, so a Chinese lead comes in, uh, we basically hand them off. We take them out. They can come in and flow into Marketo, but then we hand them off to a local marketing automation platform in, in China. So um, they generally are in and out um in a flash, um, you can see them one minute, they've gone the next, um, and we don't retain them. So in effect, it's the equivalent of like a, a data purge. So we keep, we don't keep any data um, on them. Um, and that's whether they uh, come in in English or come in in Chinese script, uh, whatever they literally come in. It's, um, I suppose we'd call it a positive bounce. They come in, but they bounce straight out. Um, and we, we hand them off. Um, and, but that again, that is uh, based on us being an American company and not wanting to handle Chinese leads um, for various reasons. Great, thank you. I have a um, piggyback question on that, if that's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> selfishly, um, have you found, just out of curiosity, when it comes to data append, we've struggled finding vendors that can help with data append for records in China? Is any anybody have any solutions to that? I mean, it's not, it's mm. kind of related, but not really related. No, um, I've just seen um, Robin's question. Is it based on inf both, uh, Robin, because uh, we don't, tr uh, because again, with people using VPNs and uh, and things like that, so we, we, we um, use the both fields, uh, inferred and stated country. Again, somebody could uh, put that they were in, I don't know, Korea or uh, Mongolia or somewhere else, uh, which uh, we would manage. But then if we find that the, the inferred country is actually Republic of China, then sorry, I can't answer your question, Jenny. That's OK. It was worth a shot. <laughs> Yeah, and I can't personally vouch for it, but I know that I recently heard a use case where um, a company uses three different data sources for um, for lead uh, enrichment regionally. So, and and specifically, they used Apollo for APAC. Oh, so mm -hmm. that was yeah, that was their solution. Can't vouch for it, but yeah, I think you know down. definitely there are different different vendors that have mm -hmm. uh, different strengths uh, in different yeah. regions. So. Our, um, well, again, it's not the whole of the APAC, it's, uh, but the China region, they do use uh, uh, Apollo, but they have their own native local local ones, which I can't even, I won't even attempt to pronounce. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, on the subject of uh, privacy subscriptions, um, we got a question around the best way to migrate unsubscribes when moving from another marketing automation platform to Marketo, or even from one Marketo instance to another one. Um, any any recommendations there? I think, uh, Jenny, let's start with you. Yeah, I think when you're migrating your system into Marketo, when you import the unsubscribes, you need to make sure you're importing them with that value set to true, but you're also capturing the reason, right? Whatever, if you have the reason from your other platform, great. Um, it's also really important for compliance. If you have the date of the unsubscribe, it'd be really great to have the date of the original unsubscribe instead of making it look like the import date was the date they unsubscribed. So try and keep that history for compliance is really key. And better safe than sorry. I've worked with a lot of companies who aren't sure who's unsubscribed and you can't move somebody who is unsubscribed. It's just so better safe than sorry. If you're unsure, they should be unsubscribed, right? So make sure you're working through that. If you have preferences, you have to be really careful. Does a preference in one area mean an unsubscribe from the rest? So like, you know, there's global unsubscribes, but there's other ways to look at it. So make sure you're looking at that correctly and migrating that correctly and always, always get compliance approval. Whatever your strategy is for that unsubscribe migration, make sure your compliance legal team, you know, approves it and gives you their blessing. 
And, um, you know, for some people, it's easy. I'm cutting over from my system to Marketo and I'm emailing out of Marketo. For some, it's, well, I'm going to import the records and then I'm going to start building. And then like, it'll be a few weeks or a few months. So if you're one of those companies that's got like that, that in between, make sure your, your unsubscribes continue to come over. It's not a once and done thing. Great. Yeah, um, I think also, you know, lots of people get into when you mentioned, like, is there does it unsubscribe in one match the other? Like, I've gone through a couple of acquisitions where there was database overlap, right? So they may have uh, unsubscribed from the acquired company, but not the, the company that did the acquiring. Um, yes. Are they unsubscribed in our new combined instance? Right? So like, fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that right. also right. applies if you've got um if you've got a preference center. So have you given people uh, a choice in the first one for say uh, language or cadence or type of communication? They might say, I only want events, I don't want your newsletters, or vice versa. So can you transpose that across? Um, are you going to have the same preferences available in the new instance? Um, but if in doubt, you're better off keeping them out. And giving people a choice as well. Like if if yeah. your preferences change, and you know, obviously, if the company's gone through an acquisition or whatever the reason is, you know, let them know the situation and and choose what they want to what they want to be subscribed to today, regardless and of what they have yeah. in the past. Yeah. And that can be a simple introduction email. It could be um, again, get your legal say. We've uh, we've we've migrated. We've uh, merged. Whatever. Uh, we'd like to keep in contact. Are you still happy? And ask them to uh, reconfirm their preferences. And if they want to be out of everything, then you've got your answer. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we are almost out of time. I'm trying to. I'm looking at the list and seeing if we can squeeze in one more quick one. All of these are big ones. Um, we can do the opener. I don't know, Carissa. <laughs> do you want to do you want to take a flying run at attribution in Salesforce and Marketo without visible? I was going to say <laughs> um, I kind of like the one that asked about our um, preferred features in Marketo that were our favorites. Way to close to it round out. robin us on our Let's way out. Do it. Um, Okay, so because I bogarted that, I'll lead. Um, I think my favorite thing about Marketo, the thing that's kept me in it for all of this time is how incredibly flexible the product is. Um, I think that it can be as creative as the professionals you have working in it. Um, so it's, you know, we've talked a lot about the API and how you could even push it further. So like, don't be afraid, dig in. It offers so much opportunity to like bolden yourself as a professional. Um, so that's what I love about it. Jenny. I want to go. Who's next? Sarah, you got to call them out. I did. I did yeah. it already. <laughs> I mean, Jenny, do you want to go? Yeah. I mean, for me, like what makes it a differentiator, and I've worked in all the platforms, but mostly Marketo, thankfully. But the strong API, like the, the API and things you can do with the API is so amazing. And so it's so developer friendly as well. So that's one of the key features for me and the trigger functionality is so much stronger than other platforms. I just, Marketo's trigger functionality, when they started building the, you know, the beautiful canvas that all the other platforms have, I was really concerned. And I vocalized to the product team, I don't want to lose my trigger functionality because all the other platforms you build that way, it really limits you on what you can do. So the trigger functionality for sure for me is, again, I could keep going, but yeah. Amazing. Okay, Zoe, Chris. Okay, um, I'll keep it quick. Um, I echo what you guys say, but I, I think for me, it's it's how intuitive it is to use. It's easy to understand, but it's harder to master. But that's what I like about it, because it gives you that satisfaction of continuous learning, evolving, and you have so many multiple use cases that you can uh, apply it to. Uh, what I What I like about it is that you can do one thing five different ways. So if it makes sense for you to do it, option A, then great, do it. You can be successful that way. And if somebody else comes in and they need it to be done in option D, you mean you can do it that way too, and it allows you to be successful. I love that. The business drives the implementation, not the other way around, right? Yeah. Okay, well, thank you all so much. Thank you, panelists, and thank you, attendees. This has been a wonderful educational experience for me and hopefully for everyone else. Um, and 
please check us out in September as well. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.